Hey, welcome back to the Group Project Podcast. This is episode number 93, and I am here with Dr. Teresa Hill. Dr. Hill, thank you so much for coming on today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. So I told Dr. Hill, I'm going to call her Teresa. We talked about this before the show. I usually just go with the first name. I talked with Teresa before the show, and quite honestly, I would just Google search who was the principal of the year in Arizona. Uh, just sort of picked a random state. I love Arizona, been in, been in Phoenix a couple of times and Dr. Hill, Teresa's name popped up. So Teresa's doing some awesome things at Walden Grove high school, which is just South of Tucson. Correct. That's correct. Okay. So first of all, congratulations. You were named the Arizona secondary school principal of the year. Congratulations on that. Thank you so much. And you've got a pretty cool, you know, you're doing some cool things there. Maybe share your educational experience and and your leadership background? Yeah, so uh, I've been in education for 29 years, Uh, was a teacher for 12. I was a math teacher for three years, Um, had the opportunity to uh, start a full-time dance program. So I did that for nine years and then jumped into administration. So I was an assistant principal in charge of attendance. And then eventually I was in charge of the career and technical education programs. I was the director of that in curriculum. Um, So I did uh, assistant principal for about five and a half years. And then I had the opportunity to open Walden Grove High School. So came over to Sawarita and and have been doing that since. So talk to me about opening up a high school. Like a lot of a lot of leaders who listen to this show have never had to open a new building. What what are some unique things that goes into that? So I was really lucky that I had the opportunity to start in January the semester before. So I was able to be part of the construction meetings. Granted, most of the stuff was already set. So there were a lot of things that I couldn't change, but there were some things that I was able to change. For example, um, the courtyard design was gravel and mesquite trees because they didn't have good experience with grass. And um, I really wanted, you know, high school kids need a place to hang out and feel comfortable in. And so I had the opportunity to change that design and Mm -hmm. add a lot of concrete add a center area where we could gather and then a lot of like bench seats. And so um, I had some opportunity to change some things, you know, in that sense. Um, But then also just the planning of you know, figuring out how many desks you need, how much furniture you need, what you need, um, and really kind of filling the school, you know, the weight room and all, all the equipment that comes along, having to figure those things out. And um, the school was already named. So the name of the school was there and um, the colors were selected. The school was uh, named after Dick Walden, who owns a bunch of pecan groves out here. So the Walden is his family name and the grove comes from the pecan groves. Um, and they had asked him, you know, what's your favorite colors? And he said red and white. So they made those the school colors, but they didn't have the mascot yet. So I had the opportunity to work with the students. We started with freshmen and sophomores, and um, I used them to help come up with uh, our mascot name. And so that's where the Red Wolves came from is the students um, voted for it. And, um, you know, just all of those things in the beginning, you know. And you said that was about what, 11 years ago? 10, 10, 11 years ago? Mm Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. So maybe reflect on the last 10 years. Like what have been the biggest lessons learned these last 10 years, 11 years, whatever you want to say? Well, I I guess I would say as a leader, you know, we tend to have our vision of what things are going to be. And definitely coming in, I thought that I had this vision of what I wanted Walden to be. And, um, you know, as I reflect back, it's so much more than what I could have envisioned because it's a shared vision. Um, It wasn't me coming in and saying, this is what we're going to do. And, you know, it was more like, what do we want? How do we want to make this our place and, you know, what's important to us. And so, you know, really working with all the stakeholders to, like I said, having the kids be part of coming up with the mascot and, um, you know, having the teachers helping make decisions when we were setting systems in place, um, all of those things and our mission and our vision statement, those are things that weren't done by me. And as we've evolved over the years, this place is 
better than I could have ever imagined it. You know, it's, it's just a good place to be. And I really feel like sometimes leaders have a hard time doing that, that, you know, that losing that control and letting go, but it's so rewarding when you do. Was there, and I hear, I ask this question a lot and I hear the same themes about this. Like at first, when I came in principal, I thought I knew it all. Uh, I thought I had all the answers. And then I realized like, I got to rely on the people I have. Was there a turning point? Was there a time at, maybe a year or two in when you realized I can't do this all alone? Well, I, I mean, I think that I, I try to be that all the way through. And I will say that you know, I was really blessed because the district that I was at before, I'll, you know, give them a shout out, Flowing Well School District. I left New Mexico to come to the district. And um, I feel like I had really, really great leaders in front of me. And then even when I stepped into the assistant principal role, I had a lot of support and I had a lot of mentorship. So I feel like coming to the principalship, I had already seen that modeled. And um, so I, I guess I understood it and, and yeah. maybe didn't make as many mistakes in the beginning because of that. Um, I think that the most challenging piece for me was that we had two high schools and the district that I came from only had one high school. So navigating through that and, you know, rivalries and, mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff was probably, and, and even just, it's a small place here. So you have the media, you know, the, the Sawarita Sun that, you know, is around and, and here more than in the Tucson Metro. So those are really the things that I had to navigate and learn how to do. But as far as, you know, from the beginning, I, I, most of my teachers were district initiated transfers. And, and if I just dictated to them what we were going to do, it wasn't going to work. And so they had to be part of that process so that I could get their buy-in from the beginning to want to be here. Same thing with the kids it was freshmen and sophomores. Well, the sophomores were already freshmen at the, at the other school. So they, they had their identity of, no, I'm a Mustang. I'm here. I don't want to go to that new school. Mm -hmm. So I had to find ways like having them come up with the mascot. And, you sure. know, I had to find ways to get them hooked on wanting to come. Sure. So maybe give us a little bit of context about Walden Grove High School. How many students, how many staff, anything else you want to share about your high school there? Yeah, we have um, currently just over uh, 1,100 students. Um, we're built for 1,160, and before the pandemic, we were busting at those numbers. And, you know, just like all schools, the numbers have declined um, since the pandemic, but I can, you know, we're climbing back up. So we're at 1,100 right now. We've got about 60 certified teachers and another 20 support staff, so just under 100 employees that are here. Um, uh, it's a comprehensive high school. You know, we don't consider ourselves a magnet of anything, um, but we really try to create spaces and opportunities for students, no matter what their interests are. So um, we focus on all aspects of in camp, in, you know, with academics and outside in extracurriculars. Oh, I apologize. Let me it's okay. Turn that off. <laughs> By the way, guys, school is still in session there. I, I, it, we're, um, uh, it's one hour behind there. So I said, could you please come on a few minutes early? So I believe I'm looking at the clock right now. School is just about to get out. So if you do need to take off for a minute, I totally understand. We can pause it, but, um, Hey, what does a normal day look like for you? <sighs> Well, <laughs> is there such a thing? <laughs> <laughs> it, it depends if it's pre-pandemic or post-pandemic. <laughs> true, true, true. So true. Because um, I would say a normal day is, um, you know, not during the pandemic, a normal day is getting into classrooms and, you know, helping, being around, being visible, being out at lunch, being out at passing periods, um, having an open door policy. So, you know, allowing teachers to come and meet with me when they need to meet with me and just being visible and, you know, really problem solving and helping people out. And I, you know, for me, the more I'm visible, the more I know what's going on. Um, sometimes people won't come to your office to tell you that they're having a problem, but if I'm popping into their room, oh, well, since you're here. Um, so really that's the biggest piece of a normal day. I'll say the challenges this year is COVID tracing. I mean, we spend a majority of our days tracing and, 
you know, identifying the close contacts, pulling those kids in, calling their parents because they're quarantined. If they're vaccinated, they're allowed to stay, but you still got to call their parents to let them know that they've been um, in close contact. And, you know, it, right now it's actually not bad. This week we've only had a couple, but you know, some weeks we'll have two and three in, in a day and it takes a good couple hours for each trace from beginning to end. So wow. that's been a, a norm this year for sure. And I should have asked you earlier, what's the leadership structure in your building? You're the head principal. Do you have a, a couple assistant principals, Dean of students? Maybe describe that real quick too. Yeah, so I'm the principal and then I my administrative team is two assistant principals, one in charge of curriculum, the other one in charge of discipline and attendance. And then I have an athletic director slash academic dean. So athletic director keeps them super busy. And then the academic dean part is mostly helping us with testing and testing coordination. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you mentioned, you talked about being visible a little bit, and, and I'm going to go into the next question, which is about instructional leadership. So when I read the press release of you being um, named the principal of the year there in Arizona, uh, one of the very first quotes that came out was your instructional leadership. Maybe talk to us about what that means to you. Yeah. Well, I believe that I always tell people that if you are burnt out of teaching, administration isn't where you need to go um, because it's just another extension of teaching is how I see it. And so I consider my staff my students as if I was a teacher. And so I'm going to want to model anything and everything that I do. You know, when I have a faculty meeting, if, you know, an expectation in my classrooms is that you have bell work at the beginning, as kids come in, they have something to do to start working on. Well, my faculty meeting is going to have bell work. Um, I want high engagement in the classrooms. So I'm going to model that when I have you know, say the beginning of the year retreat, I'm going to model that engagement. They're going to be active. They're not going to be just sitting and listening all day long to me talk. Um, so I think that's the first step is modeling what you want. Even, even last year when we were mostly remote with the pandemic, you know, I, I haven't been in a classroom teaching, well, traditional classroom since, you know, the 90s. And then from there, I went into dance which is not very traditional. Mm -hmm. And so when we had to kind of flip the switch to remote, you know, most of our teachers didn't have the skills to do that. So we had to, we had to come together and say, okay, who, who in our group here is experts in this? And, and they did PDs and I was right there with them and I was learning those things. Mm -hmm. So my teachers had to learn how to do a Google classroom. Well, guess what? I created a Google Classroom and I still use it. And it's for my staff, Red Wolf staff, Google Classroom. And I put all their stuff there so that they're not searching through emails. Mm. So I, I model that by learning that also and saying, it's okay, I may not know everything, but I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna be afraid to learn. You know, like I'm never too old to learn and, and to Love grow. It. So those are all some of the things. And then again, that visibility, you know, not just going into classrooms, for an evaluation, but going in for drop-ins. And I can tell you that that hasn't happened this year just because of all the COVID tracing, but on a normal year, I'm, you know, in those classrooms with those drop-ins as much as possible. Now drop-ins look like, okay, show me your seating chart. I need to know who is sitting next to this person. Oh, wow. gosh. Yeah. You know, we're, we're uh, a year removed from the COVID, the tracing here. We don't have to and man, you are bringing back some memories from last year. So yeah. I can all, I, I just know exactly what you're saying and how much of a, it's, it's frustrating, but it's what we do as leaders is we step up to the challenge and do what needs to be done in our right. building. Absolutely. So, so Absolutely. speaking of challenges, maybe besides the COVID tracing that you're having to do, what is the biggest challenge in your role? Um, I think the biggest challenge is always for us, at least at our school, the biggest challenge tends to always have to do, has to do with facilities. Hmm. Um, and when the school was built, I'll give you kind of background. When the school was built, it was built as a specialty biomedical school because a hospital was gonna be built in this area. And they had felt like, okay, they can combine and work together and the kids can have internships. Um, so it was built for 850 students. 
Well, in the community, they had this huge growth spurt and the other high school quickly became over um, crowded mm -hmm. and they had to change the, the direction of this school from that biomedical school to a comprehensive high school. So we went from an 850 school to an 1160, but the design was already done. And so um, our gym has seating for 850, but I refuse to have a one, you know, two assemblies. Like, no, we're still gonna have one assembly. So the challenges of how are we gonna get everybody in there so that people are seated and or in a space so that everybody can participate. Um, you know, the cafeteria is too small, but I really want to have one lunch where everybody can gather when we have activities or if clubs want to meet, um, if you have them before after school, you're making them compete with sports and other programs. Um, by having it at lunch, you can be in multiple things. And so we had to problem solve, well, what are we going to do about that? Well, kids now eat everywhere. They eat in the cafeteria. They eat outside in the courtyard. We opened up the gym lobby as another space, and they eat in the classrooms for whatever teachers are willing to have them in their room. Um, we don't have an auditorium. Uh, we have a district auditorium that we share with nine other schools. And so the challenges of, okay, now we've got a musical and you got to build your set at our school, but then you got to break it down, drive it over to the auditorium, then build it up, then take mm -hmm. it back down. And, you're, and then we're limited to how much space or time we have in there. Um, th those tend to be my biggest challenges yeah. is really just trying to not let that be an excuse. I mean, as, as a staff, we've always kind of said, we're not going to not give our kids opportunities because we have this um, challenge, but but yet at the same time as the leader of the school, it's my job to not let those things go away and just go, well, just because we're doing great doesn't mean we don't need them. You know, we still need these things. And so being that advocate and educating the community and, and people so that they understand that this, this is a need and we have to do this. Our first year, we had 19 away baseball games because we didn't have fields. We didn't have athletic fields when they built the school. So Wow. Those tend to be my biggest challenges. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'm looking at the map here. You just south of Tucson, just south of Tucson there. And you said there's nine schools in your district. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And so you share an auditorium there. Wow. So, yes. I mean, it's sometimes it's just getting staffed. I mean, you seem like you're like flexible, adaptable. We're going to make it work. Have you run into some issues with staff about not being able to see those solutions? Um. Well, not really. Um, I'm sure you've heard through your podcast that, you know, when you hire, you fire kind of thing. And so you got to make sure that when you're hiring, you're not settling and that you're getting the right types of people. And yeah. so our hiring process can be to some seem tedious and long. But for me, it's important because as I even tell people that are interviewing with us, you, I need to make sure you're the best fit for me, but you need to make sure that we're the best fit for you. Um, it, we, we tend to be a little crazy out here and we, <laughs> you know, we've got this like, go, go, go hard, work hard, play hard. Um, and if you can't do that, go home. Like this isn't the place <laughs> for you, you know? And so I would say a majority of the type of people that we hire are type A personalities, mm -hmm. super competitive. If anything, I have a challenge of trying to help them like not burn out, right you know, in. like you don't have to take five clubs, sure, <laughs> just <sure>. one. <laughs> Is there anything special you do? I love what you're saying here. Anything special, unique you do in your interview process that draws that out of your candidates? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the first thing that I do is I have screening interviews and in that screening interview, the first thing I'm checking for is, do you like kids? Because I can teach you how to be a good teacher, but I can't teach you how to like kids. And then if they pass the test on that, when we have our interview, um, there are a couple unique things, maybe not unique. I know other schools, districts do it, but we do have them teach a lesson, a 10 minute lesson. Um, and then we always have a student on the committee, okay. always. And that's key because I have, you know, a teacher from the department, which is normal, and I have an administrator, but when I add a kid, all three of us are looking for something different in the classroom. And 
you know, after the interview is over, they'll do their 10 minute lesson and then we'll do the traditional, you know, asking the questions, they yep. ask questions. And then when they leave and we deliberate, I always start with the student. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Tell me what you think. And, yeah. you know, I'll hear them and then I'll ask them, do you, would you want to be in their class? And if they go, um, I guess that I'm like, okay, nope, not nope, that's a no. <laughs> Cause I always tell them like we that. are hiring superstars or future superstars. And, um, and, you know, and sometimes that means you end up opening with a long-term sub position. Mm. And some people have been critical of that and said, you know, you, you, you can't do that, but it's a lot easier to get rid of a bad sub than it is to get rid of a bad teacher. True. I like what you're saying. I love everything you're saying there. Thanks. uh, Professional practice. You shared some great ideas around, not only hiring, but uh, your visibility, instructional leadership. What's maybe one other professional practice that you use that you would highly recommend other school principals use? Well, I feel like um, everything is based on relationships and more than just being visible, but actually getting to know as many people as you can and having real and authentic relationships with them matters. Um, And that goes for all of your constituents. You know what I mean? Um, You, you want to get to know your teachers and your staff members and your custodians and your, your counselors. And, you know, you want to get to know them, but you want to do the same thing with your students because, um, and I'll tell you that this is, I'm not great at this right now because of the pandemic. I don't know a lot of my kids. Um, You know, and when they were here, they had masks on. And, um, you know, the last two years or year and a half have just been brutal to those relationships. And so I'm actually doing some things now to try to bring back kind of the climate and the culture that we used to have, because it's not quite where I'm used to having it. You know what I mean? Um, But the relationships are the key, even with discipline. When when I have my assistant principals dealing with discipline or I am I try not to do discipline anymore, I've done my time, but if I have <laughs> to do it, it's a lot easier to do when you're dealing with a kid you know, you know? And, and so I, I think that you, you have to be willing to build relationships, not just with the adults, but with the kids. They will respect you more. They will they will be more bought into what you're doing. And, you know, my overall philosophy with high school is teenagers are great. Unfortunately, there are people out in the world that say the exact opposite, but they're great. They're amazing at young adults. And my philosophy with every decision that I make is based on, I am going to trust you to do the right thing. If you don't do the right thing, then I'm going to have to, you know, start tightening things up. Like, We were having problems this year with the um, the kids at the snack bar between classes. So I've had to turn off the snack bars. I don't want to keep them turned off. I'm hoping that we can reevaluate and go, okay, we're going to bring them back. And now go back to making sure you're in class and you're not tardy because of the snack machines, you know? Um, but I think that those are the biggest things is, you know, trust your kids to do the right things. And, and especially at the high school level, don't constrain them because the more rules you put on them, the more they're going to break those rules and the more relationships that you have with them and allow them to have a voice, um, the more successful they're going to be. I totally know, even even though I'm in the superintendent's chair, I do feel like the last couple of years has been difficult for me to build those relationships with kids. Cause you're right. Just the the mask. I can't tell who's who Uh, it's just been, it's been frustrating. So I know exactly what you're saying. So many of us have talked about that on this show. It's like, Oh, we just want to get back. And you mentioned the culture climate. Like there's just some things that we're used to doing in high schools that we just haven't been able to do that are just those awesome, cool things you do in high school. So I I totally hear what you're saying. Let's talk about you getting your doctorate. You got your doctorate in 2019, correct? I did. Yep, that's correct. So so you're relatively new Dr. Hill here. Maybe just talk about that experience. There's a lot of people listening who are like, uh, I don't know if I want to get my doctorate. Is it worth it? Just reflect on your experience for us. Yeah. So for me, I was a first, um, uh, first generation, uh, graduate, you know, getting my bachelor's to me was a big deal, um, because I was the first in my family and, um, you know, I, I didn't realize how important it was to my family until I got my master's. 
Like I just kind of knew that I was going to go and get my master's. You know, I got it in ed leadership because I had heard, for, you know, at the time it was like you either go counseling or you go ed leadership. And I felt like I had more options with ed leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and when I, I remember graduating and coming back out and my mom was super emotional and I realized that, it, you know, I was doing this for her and for me. And that it was important to both of us because she had started school but was unable to finish. And um, so for me, I it was intrinsically important for me to get my doctorate. Mm -hmm. um, I used to say, I am people smart. May not be the the you know the smartest book smart person, but I I am the smartest people smart. Like I can read people, I know, you know, I can read situations. Um, and so for me, getting the doctorate was a bit intimidating because I was a math person. My writing skills weren't great and I was a bit intimidated by it, but I knew intrinsically that I wanted to do it. And so, um, you know, I'll tell you going through the process. Um, definitely, I don't recommend if you have little kids because little kids don't understand when you got to lock yourself in your room. And my kids were old enough, you know, middle school and high school that I could say, all right, I'm shutting my door. You guys are on your own for, for lunch and dinner. Don't mess, don't mess with me. I'm doing, <laughs> I'm doing work. And so I think that it was easier on the family because they were old enough to understand that situation. And, you know, for me, it ended up being a, a great experience. Um, I can't say I always loved going to class, but when I finished, I always felt invigorated and excited and motivated. Um, I really, really enjoyed the classes. And, um, you know, as far as the dissertation piece of it, uh, you, you just have to find something. I guess everybody's, everybody's personalities are different. And I remember people telling me, don't try to change the world. Just do something easy so that you can get it done. Yeah, that's not my personality. Like I have to feel like I'm making an impact and I'm making a difference or I'm not motivated to do it. So for me, I had to find something that motivated me that I was passionate about and that I felt could make a difference um, so that I was able to push through that. And if I didn't have that motivation, I wouldn't have finished. Mm -hmm. So what was your uh, dissertation on? It was on LGBTQ student experiences in high schools. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. What was a uh, key take? Do you have any key takeaways for us? Um, you know, I, I would say that uh, a lot of what the research says, as far as, you know, having a QSA is important. Um, it, ultimately, what I find is that as an administrator, you have to be willing to address the elephant in the room and be, be an ally. Um, very much um, obvious, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Um, you, you have to be willing to do things where people can see exactly where you stand, that you're gonna support those uh, students, that you're gonna support the, the club um, and, and the things that they're doing, and that you're gonna be willing to work with families to make situations um, the best for them. And they're not always the same. Um, and if you do those things and you're outwardly being willing to do that, then you are going to make it a better place. And, um, you know, some people think, well, that's not your biggest minority. It may be your smallest minority on campus. However, if all the other marginalized students see that you are making them important, then they feel valued and important. So it really kind of spreads from not just that group of marginalized students. Yeah. And so I think that's the biggest takeaway is that you can't be an administrator who's afraid of pushback or afraid of what people are going to say. You've got to be able to put your foot down and say, I am going to make this a safe environment for all students. That is my job as an educator. Cool. Very, very cool. Okay, one last question in this section. Sure. Knowing what you know now, if you go back to your first year being an assistant principal way back at Flowing Wells High School, what would be your advice to the Miss, the, it was not Dr. Teresa Hill at the time, to the Miss Teresa Hill going into your first year of being a school administrator? <laughs> uh. Well, I would say um, that you don't always have to be right and that it's okay to it's okay to to have messed up 
You know what I mean? Like, I think when parents, parents are always the hardest to deal with, right? Parents get angry and rightfully so they are the advocate of their child. So they're going to be heated when they feel their child has been wronged. And as a young administrator, I wanted to convince them that I did it the right way and that no, this was all right. And so maybe I got defensive and I didn't allow them. They took it as they, I wasn't allowing them to be heard, you mm-hmm. know? And mm-hmm. so it made things challenging because then they weren't happy or satisfied with, with talking to me like, oh, well, she didn't even help me. She didn't even listen to me, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and I've learned over the years that people just want to be heard and, and it's okay. You don't have to have an answer for everything that they say. Just let them be heard. And so, you know, I'm, I'm really good at this where, you know, I'm not afraid to just take notes and somewhat script what they're saying um, because then they see that I'm actively concerned. I'm not just like, oh, really, what, you sure. know? Um, and, you know, being able to be an active listener and repeat back, okay, so what I'm hearing is this and, you um, really kind of getting to the core of what is it that they want from this, you know, and I may or may not be able to give them that, but I am going to give them 100% my attention and I'm not going to interrupt them. I'm going to let them talk. And until they're completely done talking, then I can jump in and, you know, give them any, any thoughts and not being afraid to say you're sorry and you're right. That shouldn't have happened. Mm-hmm. because sometimes we don't we just want to oh no our school's perfect and we don't you know no yeah. nobody does that even you know whether it's about somebody else or even myself to say like you're absolutely right I shouldn't have done that you know when you say, say that to a parent they're just like oh um okay well I don't know what to do now <laughs> I completely agree with you and I talk to our admins about this all the time about this like humility and about not being able f- not being afraid to say I made a mistake Do you feel like, and this is our new administrators I work with, it's still hard for them to do that because they still want to like prove that. And I'm I'm trying to come up with a question here, but do you feel like it takes a couple of years for you to have the confidence? Should you come in first year and be, I don't know, do you have any thoughts on that? I don't know if I'm making sense, but. Yeah, no, I I mean, I do think that, I think that age probably has something to do with it. And, and I think that what I try to do is. Um, you know, I really feel as, as a principal, it is my job to mentor my assistant principals. And I always tell them, you may not want to be a principal someday, but I'm going to prepare you to be a principal. And so um, modeling them, that with them is, is important. So if I have an angry parent and I know I have a situation that's going to happen, I'm going to have them come in my office with me and I'm going to I'm going to model that for them. And then afterwards, we're going to debrief, you know, and say, okay, what did you get from this conversation? Sure. Um, and so I think that, that you don't always have the time to do that. But if you can do that, it's helpful. You know, when I got thrown in as an assistant principal, nobody was modeling for me how to have those conversations. But I do remember when I was a teacher sitting with another administrator and the things that I appreciated from them when I was having those conversations. So maybe even if you can't model for all of them, having that conversation of like, what's important to you when you're upset, what do you want people to do, you know, and, and putting them in the other shoes so that maybe they, they can see that angle a little more. I like it. I like that explanation. Okay. Hey, this is episode number 93. I'm with Dr. Teresa Hill principal at Walden Grove High School. And I love how you say the name of your district. I can't say it like you can say it. What, what's the name of your district again? It's called Sawarita. Oh my, there's no it's way. A, Not in a, a million little years. cactus. Sawarita. <laughs> That's right. I remember that. That's right. Um, okay. We're going to move into just kind of our quick hitters here and then we'll get you out of here. Hopefully, okay. hope it looks like the school is still standing behind you um, as is. the students are dismissed. Yeah. They've got it good. under control. Yeah. All is um, good. Okay. So, um, if we are, okay. So give me a reason if we are living or if we're going to visit, uh, Tucson and you said your district is about, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes South of Tucson. Correct. And the question is if they visit, if listeners visit your city, what is one place they have to check out? So what is the main reason somebody should leave Tucson and go South to, to where your high school's at? Well, um, 
That's funny because I was going to say something in Tucson or south of Tucson. <laughs> give me one um, of each. Give me one of each. Okay, so I'll give you, if you're going to Tucson, uh, definitely you have to hit the Desert uh, Wildlife Museum. Um, it's just, it's like a zoo, but it has all natural um, habitants of the area. So you'll see a bobcat and a coyote and, you know, the the prairie. So it's really oh, native cool. to our state and the animals in our state. Um, down here, really popular is the Titan um, mu Museum, Missile Museum. Um, and honestly, it's just the beauty of being able, there's a lot of areas that you can hike. You can go up to Madera Canyon and do some hiking and see some nature. Um, you know, we're in Tucson. So most of the year, you, you know, Arizona, we have we have great weather. So yes. And you mentioned before the show, it's like 60 degrees there today. Is that right? Yeah. Or it was when you're yeah. Okay. It's a little cooler than I thought it, it would be. It is a little cooler. We're usually in the high like 70s. Okay. Right now. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. you can't see out the back window here, but here in Iowa, we've got our first like really pretty cold day here. It's like 30. Oh wow. Two or 35 degrees, something like that. Not but. even close for a, a low <laughs> right now for us. <laughs> okay, so what is one sneaky good purchase you have made that has made uh, most improved your life? <laughs> okay, this is going to sound really posh, but an, a massage chair. I I going, used to going. go, yeah, I used to go and get massages once a month just to help because I develop all this stress up in my lower back and um, had the opportunity to buy a massage chair. And I convinced my husband, well, if we buy this chair, I won't go get massages anymore. Um, and I really haven't. Um, it is amazing when I have a rough day, I can just go into my massage chair, you know, put it on zero gravity. And, and if 20 minutes isn't enough, I can do longer. <laughs> so what, give us a little more details because like, I, I, um, I don't know, you know, sometimes there's all different kinds. I mean, what yeah. would you, where would you point us? If you're saying this is, this gets the job done. <laughs> Yeah. What other details can you give us about this massage chair? Well, um, I got it at a Sam Levitz and it looks like the massage chairs that you would see in the mall because it, it massages your legs and you stick your arms in and it massages your arms and it massages your back. And then it's got a roller on the bottom of your feet. Um, and then you can put it so it'll sit but then you can put it zero gravity and then it tilts at 90 degrees. So wow. you're almost laying down while you're doing it, which wow. allows for a deeper tissue. Um, and then it has like six different settings that I can let it do its thing on its own, or I can manually, if I'm, you know, having a one certain area that I'm having a lot of stress in, I can just do it manual and focus on that one spot. Oh, that sounds so. amazing. That sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it really is. Uh, what is one book that has greatly influenced your life? Oh, that's hard because I think that I like all of the books. Um, you know, I really like Todd Whitaker's books, you know, like Shift the Monkey, very easy to read um, and applicable. So um, I think all, all of those leadership books are helpful in helping, you know, make us who we are. I, I, I really connected with the growth mindset book and we did a whole study with our school and made that, you know, a big shift. I think now a lot of schools, almost all of us do that now, but you know, when it was first new coming out, um, I thought that that was really important. I think it's important to be reading throughout so that, you know, times change and, and shifts happen. So what is one phone app that has positively impacted your life? So I try not to use my phone a whole lot. <laughs> That's good. That's good. I feel like this is a little bit of a misleading question. Yeah, I, I, can't, <laughs> think of, I can't think of any. I mean, I tend to be on the social media apps more than anything because I want to make sure we're telling our story. Yeah. So we're, we're constantly posting. I try to post at least every day um, on our school social media um, we didn't get to talk about this, but our dance team a few year, years ago went viral and they went viral right before the pandemic. It had been like five different times. They were on America's Got Talent. They were wow. on Good Morning America. And so, you know, we were able to draw quite a bunch of people into our social media world. And we want to keep those people, even though they might not be in our community. So 
I, I would say just social media in awesome. general has allowed us to tell, you know, tell our story and not wait for somebody else to tell it. That's awesome. That's really cool. Oh man. I want to watch those videos here. I, I just Google searched Walden Grove high school dance team and uh, yep. Pack yeah, there's dance a team. Marvel homecoming assembly dance. Looks like it's at the top of the list. You got it. Uh, so I'll, I'll check that out a little bit later. <laughs> uh, so what, what, what are the major gas station slash convenience stores down in Southern Arizona? Oh man. QT is all the way. QT. You got to do QT. QT quick trip. QT, yep. quick trip. All right. Hey, we got QTs up here. We got QTs. Love them. What is, so you're, so Dr. Hill walks into QT. What are the three items you're going to grab? What are, where are you going? <laughs> I'm going to get my, um, Kiwi strawberry propel. Ooh, oh, good pick. Good pick. favorite and, uh, black pepper spits, sunflower seeds. Um, someone gave me a trick a long time ago that when you are getting tired in the car, um, just have some seeds. I always have seeds in my car cause I'm 30 minutes out. If I have homecoming dance at one in the morning and I'm tired going home, I just start popping, you know, eating some seeds and it wakes me right up and gets me home safely. So those are two things that are a must when I stop at QT. What was the name? What was the flavor of the seeds? It's black pepper spits okay. seeds. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Do not, that's, I do not know that at all, but I'm writing that down right now. Is, uh, <laughs> They're the best. Out. <laughs> yep. Can you ever uh, remember a job you applied for and did not get? A whole lot. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us about one of those experiences. Well, I, I mean, I applied it, the district that I was in when I was in Tucson was a, uh, um, only had one high school and it had a bunch of elementary jobs. And so I applied for four different elementary positions um, and didn't get them, but principal positions before I applied for this position. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think that that was all meant to be, if that makes any sense. Yes, so, I ask this question every single time and every single time they say it was meant to be. Yeah. And there are people like you who, you know, didn't, who got passed up and then, a few years later, they're being named the principal of the year in the state, you know? Right, right. So a little bit of sweet redemption, I'm sure at times, at least it would be for me. So <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> uh, what is your best tip for being productive besides not being too addicted to your phone, which is good. What's another great tip for being productive? I, I think the biggest thing is just having a system and the system has to work for you. So it's okay to research different organizational systems and try different ones, but you have to find what works for you. Um, some people like to have, you know, a task bar in their calendars or they organize their emails um, so that it helps them kind of go, okay, these are the things I still have to hit on. Um, I'm a big sticky note person. Like I literally do everything. And it's funny because you know, I've had APs in the past who make fun of me because of my sticky notes, but they work for me and they help me. As you know, in these jobs, we get pulled in a lot of different directions. And so these sticky notes help keep me in line with the things that I need to follow up on. And then when I'm done with those things, I can throw that sticky away and I feel successful. Um, but not everybody works with sticky notes. You know, mm -hmm. some people have a whiteboard in their office and then they keep kind of lists of things on their whiteboard. So as, as long as you have a system and that system is built for you and works for you, that's what matters. Yep. Yep. What is one big, so you got the doctorate out of the way. Um, what, what's your big goal right now? I, I would love to be able to impact students, um, in a, in a larger scale. Um, I, you know, I've been, I've had the opportunity to teach a class uh, here through Northern Arizona University, and it's a master's level ed leadership uh, program. And I can tell you that I absolutely love, you know, doing that because I feel like I'm impacting future administrators. And if I can help make good administrators go out and into the job, then that's going to impact students in a larger scale. Um, and, I, and I don't know what I don't know what the future holds for me, but I'm open to that. If it means that I'm going to be a superintendent someday so that I can impact more students, then I'm going to move in that direction. If it's something more related to my dissertation and impacting and teaching more educators about that and how to support that group of students, then I'm open to that. Um, I, I really kind of don't 
try to like, all right, this is tunnel vision. This is what I'm doing because I, I know that, um, you know, I believe that God is going to move me where he needs to move me and he's going to put me where I can be the best servant leader. Okay. Last question. Is there anything we didn't talk about that you wanted to make sure you covered? No, I kind of got to throw in there about our dance, you know, our dance. Um, so that was kind of exciting. I, I've been looking in the background here. Yeah, I'm, I, I've I, been kind of re- just kind of skimming the story here about America's Got Talent, about going to California, all kinds of just cool things. So yeah. what sets what what sets these guys apart? I think it's the storytelling piece of their performance. And for me, it is the dance team, but it's so much more. It it gives you an insight of a high school that, you know, when I read the comments of people when they are, you know, when they're going viral each year, because we do these themes. So student council picks a, a theme like Wizard of Oz, and then our dancers do Wizard of Oz. But if you look at the dance you can see all the decorations that student council does. And our student council decorates all four walls of the gym and above. So it's it's super decorated. So the background behind the dances is really cool. Then you see our kids and you can see the different colors. Our freshmen are dressed in um, white and our sophomores are dressed in gray. You can't see the juniors and seniors dressed in red and black, but you do see that distinctness. And I think it's just that overall, we all wanted to have a great high school experience and maybe not all of us did. And, and in a way you kind of live through that when you watch this, when you watch yeah. the kids perform and you hear the energy of the kids cheering on the other side and, and it, you know, it's a big production, but I really think it's also, um, a good a good, just happy, feel good. Wow. Man, I wish my high school was like that, you yep. know, kind of thing. Yep. Wow. I just, I follow, I just followed them on Instagram here. I found the pack dance team, right? Is that what you guys call That's it? correct. That yep. is. Yep. All right. Well, cool. Well, yeah, there's some cool, you gotta check out those videos. I've been kind of, again, I've been re, look, kind of skimming these stories, looking at these videos as you're talking it's some cool stuff. Really, really Thanks. cool. Yeah. Stuff. You can find them on YouTube and like they have oh, their yeah. channel. So you can see all of the videos there at the same time and Ooh, yep. um, fun to watch. Yeah. Wow. You're right. 5 million views. Holy cow. Crazy, yes, crazy, crazy. Yes, all sir. right. Hey, Dr. Hill, thank you so much. Hey, where's a play? We, we talked a little bit about uh, social media. Uh, how, how can people, where's the best place for people to track you down at if they want to get a hold of you? Me personally? Yeah, you. Yep. Email, yeah. social media. What do you think? Yeah, no, I mean, probably social media is the easiest way. You know, you can find me on Twitter. I think it's just T Hill, uh, you know, at T Hill 1510, I think it is. It is. And, it is. You know, my, my Facebook is just Teresa Torres Hill. Um, and, you know, obviously email, the school email is T Hill at Sawarita.net. So I'm open to anybody and everybody at any time. I don't, I have Instagram. I don't use it that much. I have yeah. Snapchat, but I don't use it that much. <laughs> I you hear know? you. Like I said, <laughs> sometimes it's good to, you know, to get, I kind of get in, get out, post our stuff for school, post our yep. stuff for work. And then, cause yeah. you can really suck up a little, a lot of time, but. Oh no, absolutely. That's <laughs> the main, main thing that I do is I'm posting for our school. Um, cool. and, try not to post personally as much. <laughs> cool. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, Hey, well, thank you so much. I will let you get back to your night. I really appreciate all the knowledge that you dropped on us. Some really cool ideas. Um, again, this was episode number 93 with Dr. Teresa Hill, the secondary principal of the year in, in Arizona, there at Walden Grove high school. So keep up the great work. Sounds like you guys appreciate have a lot it. of cool things going on. Good luck with all the dealing with COVID and getting through all of that. I'm sure you guys will make it out on the other end, uh, doing just great. So appreciate it so much. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you so much. Have a good night. You too.